my name is Tirza and I'm the digital pastor here at IES. We have a few things that we want to share with you that we have online for you, for your kids, and for your teens. So we have our online services both on YouTube at IES Church and on our online pl platform, isjakarta.online.church. Have you visited our super cool website lately? You can type ieskids.org on your browser or scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. You can find so many things on there. We have lesson videos every week. We also have the arts and crafts your kids can do at home or other fun ideas and daily activities that can keep the family interactive during the week. If your teen is looking for a place to belong, believe, and become, and they can't attend an in-person service, IS Teens is just a place for you because we have soap groups that are online all throughout the week from Tuesdays all the way to Thursdays, and we have our online services on Zoom both on Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Sundays at 11, 15 a.m. And so if you're a teen and you're looking for a community, a place to belong, join us online. It's me, Marianne. Welcome to IS Online. I am so, we are so glad and so excited you are here watching us and from wherever you are. And um, we believe God's word changes lives. And every person on this earth has value and worth in Christ. Um, so we are really looking forward to connect with you, to get to know you better. We believe that it is important to be part of a community. It's vital for living well in this world. So um, welcome again and um, join me in a word of prayer. Lord, please show us our takeaway for today from your word whether it's that you call us to take a great a step into greater obedience or to just accept that your son Jesus died in our place or whether there's sin in need of repentance or to move away from it. Father, speak to us. We want to know, we want to know you more and my prayer is that we leave all our baggage at the door and just simply enter in your presence. Glory to you alone. You are the one in his mighty power working in us and who's able to do so much more we ever could ask or think. In your name, amen. I'm holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it 
You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt You are faithful there You'll be faithful now Standing on your word Calling heaven down to earth You will fight my enemies This will end in victory And I will believe it Yes, I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall
never runs out on me come to the Lord this time and come with our needs and we expect the Lord to answer us and to answer our needs and you know what we know that that all mo most of the time what we want doesn't come right at this hour what we need doesn't show up in our doorsteps but you know what's available right here and right now it's God's love God's love for you is readily available right here, right now. When you ask Him, He is more than able and more than willing to show His love for you. When you need Him, when you need forgiveness, when you need healing, that love is readily available because that love never runs out. It never runs out. Love fails, it never gives, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives, it never runs out on me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When we worship God, we honor Him, we welcome His presence, or welcome ourselves into His presence, we also bring before Him our needs, and we want to pray for one another. And if you have a need today, and you want to acknowledge your need and ask for prayer, obviously you can click for personal prayer on the Pray For Me button there, but you can also in our prayer time, ask for unspoken prayer requests. And what that does is you just acknowledge your need and we begin to pray for you. We pray for unspoken prayer requests in our in-person service and our online service. And in all of the services together, we pray for one another. So if you're not having a request today, please be in prayer for those who have acknowledged their unspoken prayer requests and not just here in the online format, but all of the Church of IES, whether it's the other services, in person or online. So we want to pray today for your needs. We also want to pray for God's work to be accomplished. We, we are very aware that the kingdom of God needs to continue to grow, that God's desire is for all of humanity to know him. And so today we want to make special prayer 
for the growth of the kingdom of God here in Jakarta and around the world. So would you pray with us today as we pray one for another? Lord God, you see all those who have acknowledged their need today. They recognize that they need your touch. Lord, we ask that you would minister to them personally, to the unique individual needs that are represented here. For those who have clicked on the button or those who will raise their hand in the services of in person, I pray, Lord God, that you would move in their lives and their circumstances, that you would show your truth and your power, that you'd bring wisdom, that you'd give healing, that you'd increase faith and give peace, whatever is needed, Lord God. We want to lift to you the burden that we have for your kingdom growth. We know that there are many places where people are antagonistic to your faith. Some are antagonistic in a very physical, uh, violent way. Some are antagonistic purely in a philosophical way. But we know there is a lot of opposition. And Lord, we pray that you would break down the opposition. And we pray that you would use us, your people, Lord God, to move your kingdom forward. I pray that you would use us, those of us that are participating in this service right now, to be able to share your word, to be able to express your grace and mercy, to show people the open door they have to come into your presence and to walk with you. Lord God, we pray that you would use us, you would empower us, and that you would accomplish your work in us. And Lord, part of that is giving. We pray that you would use our gifts for your glory. We pray that you would use the offerings that we give for your purpose to bring about your kingdom in this world, that you would minister to the hurting, that you would raise up the weak, that you would minister to those who need wisdom, Lord God, and direction, and to bring clarity for those who are in darkness, that they would see your light. Accomplish your work through us, Lord, and accomplish your work in us as well, we pray. Have your way in all we do, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everyone. This week, we're back talking about stronger families, and I'm equally as nervous as I am excited to be here. This is my second season at IES. My official title is the Digital Pastor, and the idea is that I am here for you. My heart is to be able to walk with you and pray with you and encourage you, even if we're separated by oceans or time zones. You're my people. That said, we would love to connect with you if you are here for the very first time. Uh, we have a visitor card that you can fill out. Um, or if you have been here for a while, just reach out in the chats and we will get back to you. Um, so before I started this new season at IES, I took a little break. And I kind of binge traveled. I spent a little less than six months uh, in the US because I wanted to explore. And if I'm being honest, uh, I was revenge traveling after two years of being grounded. Uh, before I left, I did something that could only be described as adulting. I made a will. Because, you know, things can happen. It's prudent to be well prepared. And that was new for me. And this experience started me on a journey of reflecting on legacy. What will I leave behind? To whom shall I leave this legacy? Actually, this particular train of thought started um, a while back, in 2014 when my dad passed away, and then it resurfaced in 2021 when my mom passed away. You know, I have been coming to IES since I was 17, and most of you who um, have known me since then have never met my parents. So I wanted to share them with you. 
My dad, Daniel, and my mom, Magda, were pastors. They were traveling evangelists for about eight years until they felt that God um, called them to plant a church in Jakarta, and that was about 36 years ago. My mom was also a biology teacher, and I had the awkward privilege of being taught by her in high school. All I can say about that is uh, I survived. My dad did not like borrowing money, and my mom was a huge saver. So when they passed, they had something to leave me with. The only thing they didn't leave me with was their church. If you're familiar at all with the Indonesian church expectation, uh, when the pastor passes away, the expectation is that their child was to inherit the church and pastors the church after them. Uh, I'm a licensed minister with the Assemblies of God, uh, but my parents and I had had a discussion long before they passed that leading that particular church wasn't something that I was called to do, and it also wasn't a good fit for me. So my parents never expected me to take over the church. I actually had to formally give up the right to the position. That was in interesting. Uh, so this thing about inheritance and legacy is big on my mind. It is biblical to leave an inheritance for your children and your grandchildren. Proverbs 13 verse 22 says, Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. Last Sunday, before our Sunday morning church service, I was sitting out in the foyer having coffee with a couple of my friends, and we started talking about characters in the Bible. We ended up talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how flawed they were. Some of the things they did, I'm surprised they had half decent family. Some might even label their family dysfunctional. Abraham was a coward who kept telling people that his wife was his sister so he wouldn't get killed. Isaac played favorites and his wife ended up concocting a plan to deceive him so her favorite could get the prime blessing. Jacob stole Esau's birthright. Esau tried to kill Jacob. Jacob's sons planned to kill their brother and ended up selling him as a slave. Well, that ought to make us feel a little better about our families. My observation, though, is that even though they were flawed human beings, these patriarchs of the promise passed down not only wealth, but their faith as well. All through the Bible, God was known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Somehow, even through the dysfunction, even through their weaknesses and their flaws, these people passed down a legacy of faith. The most important legacy we leave is, a, is faith well lived. Let's take the time and read from 2 Timothy 1 verses 1 through 14. I will read from the New Living Translation. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. 
He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. That is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learn from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, within us. Carefully guard the precious truth this, that has been entrusted to you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you speak to us, speak truth into our lives, and challenge us, Lord, to live lives of faith. We love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the books of First and Second Timothy were letters sent from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. And he called Timothy his dear, dear beloved son. They're not related. After Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement over John Mark, they decided to part ways. The next chapter in Acts 16, Paul and his new minister, ministry partner, Silas, met a young disciple named Timothy in Lystra, or is it Lystra? I'm not quite sure. Timothy's grandmother, Lois, was a believer, a Jewish woman of faith. Her daughter, Eunice, Timothy's mother, was also a believer. She married a Greek, though. So young Timothy grew up with a strong faith in the Lord, even in a culture that didn't support his faith, even with a father who probably wasn't a believer. Eunice named his, her son Timothy, a personal, a personal name meaning honoring God. Then Timothy met Paul. And Paul became a father to him, a true father in the faith. And Timothy became his dear, dear son. This epistle was Paul's last letter. He was in prison and he expected that this time he won't make it. So he wrote a letter to someone he loved dearly. Timothy's lineage of faith came both from his biological parentage and his spiritual parentage. What does this mean? This isn't just a message for parents or, or children of parents. This is a message for everyone. We all leave some kind of legacy. The question now is what? We are entrusted with a precious truth, faith in God. In a different translation, verse 14 says, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Your relationship with God is personal. It's a decision you make, but you learn about God and you witness lives lived with God through someone. Maybe it's your parents and your grandparents. Maybe it's a best friend, a mentor, a pastor, a youth leader, a parent-in-law, a teacher at school. We all learn about faith from someone. And now, as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, some days more dysfunctionally than others, our faith begets others. So how does this work? How do we leave a legacy of faith? Paul told Timothy in verse 13, follow the pattern I lived out. Do as I do. Timothy followed Paul around, and when he was ready, he led his own ministry. But he knew how Paul lived. He knew how Paul struggled. He knew what Paul's prayer life was like. He knew how Paul worked together with Silas in their missionary journeys. He knew Paul's friends. He knew them by name. He knew how Paul related to the people around him. He didn't just hear Paul's instructions. He got to see Paul's relationship with the Lord lived out. So there's this saying, do as I say, not as I do. Meaning follow my instructions, even though I might not apply it myself. This does not work with faith. Actually, it doesn't work with a lot of things. But we live out our faith and others follow the pattern. Our faithfulness, tangible, lived out, real faithfulness is the key to someone else's faith. I had the privilege of seeing my parents live out their faith. 
they didn't just tell stories about God. They showed me what life with God was like. I often, growing up, would walk into the room and see my dad deep in prayer, talking to God. And even when he was struggling in his health towards the end of his life, he cried, screamed, yelled, and listened to God. My mom prayed unceasingly. She always had this piece of paper stuck on the wall with names of people she was praying for. Mine was on there. She would pray as she drove to work and get stuck in traffic. I saw how her rough edges softened because she was constantly in the word. When my parents struggled in their marriage, I saw my mom speak truth over their marriage. And I saw them work out their marriage. They didn't just tell me stories about Jesus. They lived out their relationship with the Lord and I got to see it. However, often we think that, you know, the other people need to copy us and become mini-me's. We think that the right way of faith is our way. While we forget that what we're entrusted with is the faith, not the box it came in. Each generation is meant to train the next, but not into its mirror image. The goal is and always will be Christ-likeness, not us likeness. Paul's ministry was moving around, apostleship, getting captured everywhere. Timothy's was to stay in one place, lead God's people, and stick with it. Their scopes and hows are different. Their challenges were unique, but the faith is the same. I learned this from my parents. When I had the discussion about my parents' church with them, they realized that the call that God has on my life was different, a different scope. They also realized that I'm way more comfortable in an international intercultural setting than I am in a more Indonesian-speaking traditional church setting. And their charge to me was do the work of ministry. They were quoting Paul when they said this, be prepared, preach the word in season and out of season. It wasn't about what I was doing, in which, in which setting it's about the faith that I lived out. How else do we do this? The Holy Spirit guides us and help us guard this precious truth. Friends, we can't do this without God. We can't live out our faith well without living lives that walk by the Spirit, with the Spirit, alongside the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to help us as we live out our faith tangibly in a very, very real way. How else do we do this? We share. I'm overwhelmed by Paul's relationship with Timothy. What he shared with Timothy, Timothy was pastoring a church that Paul started. The church had issues. And in both his first and second letter to Timothy, we get a glimpse of what their relationship was like. Paul shared his experiences with Timothy, stories of struggle, stories of victories. Paul shared his knowledge strategies of how to create order from chaos that is church leading. But more than that, Paul shared his values, his values about how to treat others, his values about ministry, his values about people. But most importantly, Paul shared his values about the gospel. And you know, it wasn't just Paul. If we look in 2 Timothy 3, Towards the end, Timothy, like Paul was encouraging Timothy and said that, Timothy, you were taught the scripture since you were really young, since your childhood. And so that means it was way before Paul. Lois, his grandmother, and Eunice, his mother, taught him the scriptures. And that was what Timothy went back on. He had that, that foundation. It wasn't just Paul. Paul also shared his feelings, his vulnerability. I love just reading these things that Paul wrote. I long to see you again. I'm going to be filled with joy when I see you again. The anguish, the laughter, the sadness he shared. He shared when he's 
concerned about Timothy. Later on, or even before that, it says um, in, in 1 Timothy, it says, like, drink a little wine with water. You have a weak stomach. Take care of your health. Don't forget to sleep. Don't forget to come and visit me. He had concerns about Timothy, and he shared them. Paul also shared encouragements and much-needed pep talks. One of the most famous ones a lot of you can recite don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Be an example in faith, in love, in purity. Come on. That was Paul's pep talk to Timothy. Not only that, Paul spoke the truth over Timothy. Oh, some of the charges that Paul left to Timothy. You don't have a spirit of fear. What you have is power, love, and self-discipline. All scripture is God-breathed and useful. So use it so that you, man of God, will be complete, equipped for every good work. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Fulfill your ministry. All of these truths that Paul spoke over Timothy's life, Timothy's ministry. It's part of his relationship with Timothy. God sometimes used people like Paul to speak truth over us, transforming something in us, challenging us to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. So what if God uses you to speak truth over someone else? calling them forth to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. The most important legacy we leave is faith well lived. Every Christian is gifted with influence. We're all holding class whether or not we're intentional about it. Parents, you are influencing your children's lives whether or not you are aware of it. Spiritual parents, spiritual, spiritual aunts and uncles, spiritual brothers and sisters, you are influencing other people's lives whether or not you're aware of it. We are actively teaching others how to speak, love, relate, fight, hate, encourage, discourage, build up, tear down. So for the sake of everything pure and holy, be intentional about your faith. Be intentional about how you live your life. Our connectedness is God-ordained. Our faith isn't meant to be just for us. And it starts now. I was gifted with amazing parents. More than material inheritance, the legacy that my parents left me was faith well-lived. I have so many stories of how I've witnessed my parents live out their faith their lives in faith. They taught me these things. They showed me these things. Growing up, I had front row seats to faith well lived. They didn't just share this with me. They, there were spiritual sons and daughters, students, co-workers. I want to show you my favorite photo of my parents. My faith, it's on your screen. This was taken way before I was born. <laughs> This, though, shows what my parents valued, and this was how they encouraged me. Back in 2011, I was still in Seattle. I had this opportunity to be a part of a church plant. I had a perfectly good job in another church. It was stable, great income. Accepting that church plant opportunity meant a severe pay cut, and I, I was offered that, I was invited to be a part of that, and I was praying about it, and I felt like that was something God was inviting me to do, and I was scared. So I picked up the phone, I called my parents, and um, I talked to my dad. My dad has always been the quiet person so he prayed over me but my mom was always the one who challenged me and so on the phone she said if that's what God called you to do then do it what are you waiting for and I needed my parents to pray over me and I needed them to speak truth over me and say if that's what God's calling you to do be faithful and be obedient and do it even if it meant a pay cut. 
I realize that a lot of my examples are ministry-based. I'm not saying that you should all be pastors and plant churches. You leave a legacy of faith, whatever your vocation is. Even if you're in the restaurant business or a stay-at-home dad, your faith is still supposed to be lived out. Your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your coworkers, your business partners need to be able to see faith well lived out. I mentioned that I started thinking about legacy this past year. Actually, I had more of like a crisis, early midlife crisis or post-pandemic crisis. Whatever it is, I wasn't sure if I was still cut out for ministry. I was wrestling with God about this and asking him, rather self-focused, I know. I asked him whether the last 14 years in ministry made a difference. I was at a crossroads uh, trying to make a decision between two perfectly good jobs, uh, one of them being back here in IES. And there were two things that happened. First thing was um, I kept on having coffee with PD and he was encouraging me not to take the job, but encouraging me in my faith, in my calling, in my ministry, and just ministering to me. The other thing was something that God revealed to me. God gently taught me this one particular lesson. Um, I had the opportunity to go around uh, and visit some of my former teens from years in youth ministry, from when I was in Seattle all the way to um, my teens from IES, or my former teens from IES. Some are doing great, others not so much. Uh, the starkingly big realization wasn't that, oh, I did all of that, or that was my legacy. The big realization for me was that God let me be a part of their lives, a part of all of these stories. I am not responsible for how their lives turn out. All God asked for me was to be faithful in my connectedness. So are you going to be faithful in your connectedness? As parents, are you going to live out your faith in front of your kids? How about in your relationship with your adult children? As spiritual parents, spiritual aunts and uncles, are you going to live out your faith well to the people around you? The most important legacy we leave is faith well lived. Every child of God is part of a lineage of faith. Imagine in eternity if without explanation, God ordered us all in multiple strands of immensely long lines fanning outward from one starting point. Imagine if God's voice then thundered, behold your lineage of faith. You see your children there. You see your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. You see your spiritual nephews, spiritual nieces, spiritual brothers and sisters. We are part of a lineage of faith. We pass on this treasure, whether to our biological children or to our spiritual children. This faith, well lived, is the most important legacy we leave. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have entrusted us with this precious treasure faith, the knowledge of who you are and a relationship with you. Lord, we want to live our lives in such a way that our faith is well lived, that the legacy that we leave behind is faith well lived, and that others, whether they're related biologically to us or not, and see what faith in God is like, what life with Jesus is all about. Lord, help us. Empower us. Remind us to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. And friends, as we close this service, I want to remind you 
And I want to charge you to go forth and live a well-lived out faith. Expressing God's love that you have experienced to others. To share the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to walk humbly, guided by the Holy Spirit, every step of the way, every day of our lives. Until we meet God face to face and we see the lineage of faith. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday. And I belong to you. I belong to you. In my words, Lord, I'll be gentle. In my actions, kind and thoughtful. Because I belong to you I belong to you I belong to you I'll be honest in my dealings I'll be fair and not self-seeking cause I belong to you I belong to you And I will live for you Every day, Lord, I like justly I love mercy and walk humbly Cause I belong to you Every day is a gift from you And I live it just to please you Cause I belong to you I belong to you Here's that I'm the digital pastor here at IES. We have a few things that we want to share with you that we have online for you, for your kids, and for your teens. So we have our online services both on YouTube at IES Church and on our online pl platform, iesjakarta.online.church. Have you visited our super cool website lately? You can type ieskids.org on your browser or scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. You can find so many things on there. We have lesson videos every week. We also have the arts and crafts your kids can do at home or other fun ideas and daily activities that can keep the family interactive during the week. If your teen is looking for a place to belong, believe, and become, and they can't attend an in-person service, IS Teens is just a place for you because we have soap groups that are online all throughout the week from Tuesdays all the way to Thursdays, and we have our online services on Zoom both on Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Sundays at 11.15 a.m. And so if you're a teen and you're looking for a community, a place to belong, join us online.